so now now we're going to be looking at things with um, false teachers and, and whatnot, and it's going to get a little bit confusing. So I'm going to try and approach it without trying. I'm, I'm going to try to stay away from extremes, because if you are familiar with YouTube YouTubers, they like to do this kind of extremism thing where if somebody ever says something ever that's not true, then they're a false teacher. And it's like, well, not necessarily. You know what I mean? And uh, so let, let's let's try and look at this and see what happens. So everyone has faults in their beliefs and actions. We're, it, that's just something that everybody has. So um, you know, so we all have it in our head that we're completely right about everything and you know whatnot. And that's just not true. Everybody is has some fault in their belief. Um, no one is perfect. But see, the problem is, is that people who support false teachers will often say, "Well, nobody's perfect," and it's like, "Well." <laughs> Once again, you don't have to go to the extremes. So let's 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 try to keep plowing through this. Leaders are judged harsher, though, than you know, just your uh, typical person. Uh, God does judge har leaders harsher, and so the question becomes, you know, if if you're not ready to teach, maybe you shouldn't teach. <laughs> and uh, if if you're not real sure about your beliefs, well, once again, maybe you shouldn't teach. Because you are held to a higher standard. Obviously, you shouldn't wait till you're perfect, because you never will be perfect. But there should be some kind of a balance between perfection and you know complete whack job loonies, you know. Um, so a, a leader should really strive to learn and to grow, and it should be like a lifestyle for them, absolutely. And uh, you know the thing is, a, as a leader, if somebody brings something to your attention of something that could potentially be false. It's important that you have the mindset of going to it with prayer and going to the Bible to find an answer to see rather than just assuming that you're right. Um, in many ways, the ability to be taught or corrected is actually more important than having perfect beliefs. Um, let's say, for instance, excuse me, um, what I teach is, is pretty on topic or pretty on, uh, on target, but... I, I can't be taught anything, so I think that I am just completely wise about everything, and so I just kind of plateau with my with my with my growth. I am the epitome of knowledge. I can't get any better than this, right? Well, so then my my teaching is going to get stagnant. I may get stagnant. And my, the people who I train are going to be stagnant. There's just going to be a wall that I hit. But at that same time, let's say for instance, I, I have a, a blind spot in my in my beliefs. Um, maybe it's something to do with the end times. Okay, so it doesn't really affect too much about uh, my beliefs and, and my life and, and ministry and that kind of thing, but it's just this kind of glaring hole there. But I have the ability to, to be taught where somebody can correct me on something and say, you know, that's not totally accurate. See what I mean? And I'm able to think about it and process it. That's a very valuable trait. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, teachers shouldn't have most of their teachings be false. <laughs> and they shouldn't willfully um, manipulate people or lie to people. And they shouldn't, on purpose, twist things. Um, those are things that you know teachers should not do. Um, although an occasional falsehood is inevitable, um, I know for a fact there's been times that I, I've been talking and I've said something, and then like a couple weeks later I'll go back and be like, oh, that wasn't totally on target. Uh, another example is my dad's not great at history, so sometimes he'll he'll say something about history, and you know I'll think, mm, no, that's not historically accurate. But it didn't really alter the point that he was making in his sermon. See what I mean? So an occasional falsehood is inevitable. There's, there's going to be something. You either misspeak or you say something of what you assumed at the time or something like that. Um, but still, if you aren't ready to teach, you, you definitely shouldn't <laughs> teach. Um, now, with that being said, you're going to run into a lot of teachers who are very passionate about what they say. Um, you know, they 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 just they speak with such enthusiasm. They really pull you in. You're like, man, this guy, he really means what he says. He's got such passion. He he must be right. But the thing about passion is, passion doesn't make it true. And that's a difficult concept to get our heads around because we think if someone is a false teacher, they'll know that they're a false teacher and they'll be doing it on purpose. But people can get misled and then think that they're mature enough to lead. See what I mean? And kind of get themselves into a bit of a problem. And they'll have it with passion, but the passion will be based off of a falsehood. 
So that brings us to the idea of where their heart is. We looked at this last week, what they do, you know, what is the fruit and, uh, and, and what they believe. Analyzing what somebody believes is a window into whether they are false or not, but it is not the only window. There's also the window of what they do. You will know them by their fruit. Um, and also where their heart is, which comes out through their words and through their actions. But amidst all this idea of compromise with you know not being too one side or the other side, there are some things that are absolutely essential that they cannot be budged on, they cannot be ignored. Uh, an example of this would be that Jesus is the only way to be saved. That is like an absolute essential. Um, this isn't there, there's some areas where people can misspeak or believe incorrectly on. It's not really gonna ruin everything. But if there's a teacher who does not believe that Jesus is the only way to be saved, that's 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 something you cannot um, that, that, that that's a wall you can't climb. That's something that needs to be like addressed. You know what I mean? That's that's not something that can just be ignored. Um, um, and then the idea of of, of God, uh, which I'll get to in just a minute. Um, and we'll look at jo Joyce Meyer um, and the idea of us being little gods next week. We're actually going to look. Uh, it's from a part that Jesus said. Um, that I have never actually heard a pastor preach on. We're going to look at that, then we're going to look at the Old Testament passage that G Jesus is citing, and then we'll look at Joyce Meyer and ask the question, you know, so is she a false teacher or not? We'll look at that next week. Um, but I do want to say this, that a lot of times um, false leaders and teachers, they work a lot like a cult. Uh, if you remember a couple years ago, we were talking about cults, and there's just some things that very much so relate. Words and phrases are often changed, their definition is often changed, but they use the same word, and they use it the same. So they'll say, you know, salvation, but they mean something else. They'll say, um, you know, uh, sin, but it doesn't mean something that angers God. I instead of, instead of sin, sin being something that's against God's moral standard, it'll be something that we... Um, that brings us guilt. It's all about us. You know what I mean? So they use the same words. It's just that the definition will change. And we looked at that with cults. Cults do it all the time. Well, surprise, surprise, false teachers do this exact same thing. They'll, they'll say things, and you think that you're talking about the same thing, and you're not. You know? And so they'll say things like, oh, yeah, I believe that Jesus is, is, is you know, God, and he's, he's the way to be saved. But then as you talk to them, you start realizing that, well, we're all kind of little gods, you know what I mean? And they'll say little things like that, and it's like, well, now hold on, what? What did you say? Or, oh yeah, Jesus was God, but he needed the Holy Spirit in order to, you know, um, do what he did. So he's not really God? That doesn't make sense. Oh, Jesus is God, but he still could have sinned. But can the Father sin? Oh, no, 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 God can't sin. But you just said that Jesus was God and that he <laughs> could sin. See what I mean? And so there's this, like... There's this kind of this disconnect between false teachers, the words that they say, and what they actually kind of mean. And it's kind of alarming because you see a lot of the um, those same patterns emerging in a lot of the popular uh, teachers of the day. And I, and I hate to beat a dead horse. Well, actually, I, I kind of like it. You know, they're just sitting there helpless. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Johnson is a big fan of, of, of this Bethel Church. You know, they, they say one thing, but they don't necessarily mean what they say. You know what I mean? Like... A good example of this is the way that the way that he teaches about like the apostleship, and we'll talk about the fivefold ministry of the church in, in a couple weeks, uh, probably in September. But you know, he never outright necessarily claims that he's an apostle, but then he teaches about it, and then he kind of like embodies it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so then, if you call him an apostle, it's okay, you know, but he's not going to claim it himself. It's it's kind of like one of those things. Um. Also, with cults, you'll notice that the emphasis doesn't stay on Jesus. It, it's kind of sporadic. And the same thing is true on false, on false uh, leaders and, and, and false doctrines and those kinds of things. Like the doctrine of us being a little, a little God, how does that put the emphasis on Jesus? How at all? You see what I mean? Um, so there should be noticeable improvement. Um, with a person who's teaching, the, their 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 character and their beliefs should continue to evolve, should continue to progress. Um, if someone is still, let's say for instance, Joyce Meyer 20 years ago said that we are little gods, but now let's say that today she doesn't teach that. Just roll with me on this. Roll with me on this. Yes, 
Exactly. What did you just say? She changed. Right. There would be a progress. And so that, that definitely does need to be taken into account. All teachers are going to have their blind spots, and they're going to occasionally misspeak and that kind of thing. But there should be a noticeable improvement. You know? And... Um, rather than a deterioration of beliefs. And if you look at a lot of the teachers, especially the false teachers, you'll notice that it's not that they stay where they are, they they degrade. We had we had a, a person who, who used to come and uh, give these these special services and whatnot and, and you know at first it was really good, but over time they got more and more into Bethel Church's nonsense and their teachings degraded as well until finally by the last time that they were that they came to our church, it was like unrecognizable from from the, and the thing that surprised me is that they based themselves on the power of the Holy Spirit but the last time that they came they spoke with such less power than the first time that they came see what I mean and so that's what I'm talking about deterioration of beliefs so some false teachers have a cult like following out uh, Chuck was actually telling me about this guy who's who's been proven wrong multiple times what was his name uh, Peter Papa yeah Peter pa Pop off. Pop off. The, that guy that has that that like three o'clock in the morning uh, uh, healing thing, and he's been shown proven to be false countless times, and he still has a following. Some false teachers have a cult-like following, and some are actually a cult. Like for instance, the Jehovah's Witness. Now, if you remember, cult being by its most broad definition a minor variation of a greater whole. Okay, so you've got Christianity. Right, and then Jehovah's Witness claims to be Christianity, but it differs on most, if not all, topics. Or Mormonism, you know, who claims to be Christian, but once again differs on most big issues. Um, so where God is moving, there are proofs. These false teachers, they'll, they'll go on, they'll go on all these tangents and, and and really try to work you up with their enthusiasm and stuff. But where God is really moving. There's going to be some kind of a proof. Um, you know, somebody's going to be more, uh, you know, when the Holy Spirit moves, somebody's going to feel a stronger draw to God, uh, or um, they'll have more patience or kindness. Something, there's, there's a proof of God working. You know what I mean? If, if there is no movement of the Holy Spirit, all you had was chills, that's not really the Holy Spirit. That's just an emotional encounter. Now, that could be in part due to maybe. Something to do with the Holy Spirit. Probably not the Holy Spirit actually moving in you, though. Um, so then that brings us to the idea of Joyce Meyer. And w once again, I already mentioned it. We'll mention this next week. She taught that we're little gods. And she made it very clear that she didn't say God with a capital G, but with a little g. And so the question that becomes, well, what, what exactly do you mean? And so I, I would like to be able to talk to her and just figure out, you know, what did, exactly did you mean by that? And do you still believe it? I think that would really help. But once again, the problem is is that a lot of the false teachers, they don't offer a whole lot of clarity. They have these these TV shows and everything, and then they, they say these little things, and it leaves you with unclear beliefs. But the what is the effect of that? Well, the effect is the elevation of us. Has Joyce Meyer done a lot of good? Yes, she's done a lot of great things. Has she done a lot to help people? Yes. I fail to understand how teaching that we are little gods is going to help us. It just seems like it's a, an elevation of a person. It's kind of new age, almost. Right, which is why I'd like to know her, know exactly what she meant by that statement. <clears throat> um, and so then, whenever I'm stuck in a situation like that, one thing that helps is look at what's her point or the person's point of what they're saying. Is the main point that they're saying true, even though how they got there is debatable? Grace, can you shut that one? This one? That one. I can't see. Jack Crab. Um, so, you know, it, it's something where we have to get to a point of being being willing to take a – I can actually see again um, – a, a real look at, at teachers and, and at doctrines and stuff. It's very important that you don't just – regurgitate things you know we're, we live in a facebook society right you see something oh that that sounds good it must be true i'll reshare it and we do the exact same thing with teachers too oh that sounded good I'll, I'll i'll grab onto that so then when that facebook culture goes to the bible what they do is uh no 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 oh i like this part 
You see what I mean? It's, it, other, other generations did it too. I'm not saying that we're the only ones did that. But we must have a greater discernment than chasing feelings and chills and mystical encounters and the appearance of spirituality. There has to be, there has to be more that we go for than that. However, I noticed that there's something that happened in me, and it's something that the that Paul actually warns us about. Uh, I believe it's in one of the books of Thessalonians. He says not to despise the work of the Holy Spirit, and oftentimes that's exactly what happens. A false teacher or whatever will come by and just make things weird, like Bethel Church. They just make things weird. And so then it kind of gets where you get to the point of just eh, being kind of skeptical of any of the workings of the Holy Spirit. You know what I mean? Where you're just like... Uh, and, and even it, whereas in a good sense you're still on edge like is it going to turn weird you know and so it's very important don't despise the Holy Spirit because of the people who abuse it um, so our, our goal though is Christ that's that's the goal of the church it's not it's not power it's not wealth um, there's some people who teach and we're going to look at this very briefly dominion th theology and the idea is that you know we're establishing a Christian government no no our goal is Christ um, and it, it does need to be said, though, you know, we live in a time where there's just so m there's so many false teachers, and we're aware of them. Before, there might have been a false teacher, like let's say over there, and the whole world didn't know about it. Well, now in our era that we live in now, I mean, not only are they everywhere, but I mean, you really hear about it too. With that, it kind of gives people this idea of, you know, the church is kind of irrelevant. The church is very, very corrupt. The church is, well, because you get constant negative press all the time. But the thing is, and this is something that should encourage us, the Old Testament has strong condemnation for leaders who take advantage of people. If you read through the pro prophets, it's there again and again and again about the false prophets and the false leaders who were just taking advantage of people. So, I mean, this is something that, you know, it's very frustrating. We get very upset, but it's something that God also gets upset about. So, I mean, that should give us some comfort. That's not the ideal of what God wanted. <laughs> um, so there's this modern problem, um, and we're about to segue into looking at more specific things. Uh, but there's this modern problem, right, where you have this really sugary cereal, right? You, you, you go and you get it, and, and, and you put your milk in and everything, and what's the first thing that a kid does? They eat out all the sugar, right? And then all that's left is that, the, those bits that have like, uh. right, and they get all soggy and gross, you know what I mean? And that's all that's left, and so then your mom's like, well, yeah, you got it, you have to finish it, and so you're just... <laughs> The lucky charts. Yeah, 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 it's like, Ugh. I think what I'll the, eat my cereal dry, mom. Checks when it gets a little Oh, don't even talk about the checks now. That's freaking gross, dude. Oh. But yes, okay. So, so we have this this, this modern problem with, with cereal, and what they say on the commercials is, it's a part of a complete breakfast. Yeah. A part? How? <laughs> how is this a part? Because it has one vitamin somewhere in there. <laughs> I didn't say how big of a part of it it was. And yeah, <laughs> um, and the problem is, is that we kind of have that same thing that we do with the Bible. We eat the parts of the Bible that that are appeal to us. They're sugary, and then the rest of the bit we just kind of toss out, as it's just not, it's just not as yummy as the other parts. So then that gets us into into uh, into real problems with um, with our growth because God doesn't want us to be sporadic in our growth, hanging on sugar. Okay? God wants us to have sustained growth. Um, God accepts us where we are, but he doesn't leave us there. And that's one of the one of the problems with still being into false teachers. When you first get saved, you listen to a false teacher, and you're like, oh, that, that may really made me feel better. Well, you, okay, you, you're a baby Christian. You know? After 10, 15 years of, of being a Christian, you should be past the cereal, the, the sugary breakfast by now. You, know? you should move on to maybe toast. <laughs> This is something that you shouldn't be stuck here. Um, and this is what people have a hard time with. Well, you know, God loves me just as I am. Oh, okay, that, does that mean that you have to be an infant in your thinking? Is that is there no other way that we can address this? Um, it, it's, it is, very, though, very counterproductive to hate the false. You're, you're going to run into people who are just false. They, they, pretend, they, they pretend to be something that they're not, and they're going to you know, have their little smiles and stuff. It's counterproductive if you start hating them or looking down on them. It just, it'll just start changing you, and then you'll turn into a false, false person, you know, putting on a fake smile and stuff. It's counterproductive. Um, 
But, however, the false teachings do need to be addressed, and they need to be addressed with patience and gentleness. But with all that being said, remember that you can't change someone. If somebody is choosing to be a, to be a false teacher, you really can't change them. They, it's, that's their choice. You can try and intervene. You can warn them. You can um, try and curb it before it starts getting other people off. You, you, these are all things you can do. But the thing that you can never do is you can never change somebody else's heart. You, you can't do that. Um, God can, but we really can't. And so what happens is if we allow ourselves to be to, to go as Christians with this really uh, starved for spiritual growth, it's like it's like we're wanting to grow, we're wanting to get closer to God, and we have that desire deep inside of us. We know something's off. We want to have peace. We want to be closer to God, and oh, well, nothing I do seems to make this. Well, well, see, the problem is, is that we starve ourselves for spiritual growth. We won't read the Bible. We won't pray. We won't get in church. We won't get involved in other people's lives. And so what we try and do is we try and feed off of others. And you see this happen. I'll give I'll give you three examples. Um, it's not on this slide. So I'll give you those three examples in just a little bit. Um, but when when we allow ourselves to be starved spiritually, it'll, it, this is what causes false teachers. You should never leech off pastors or churches for, for growth. What do people do? They go to a church, oh, I, I'm just not growing there anymore. How about you start reading the Bible? See what I mean? We make it all the pastor's fault if we're not growing. We make it the church's fault if we're not growing. He's not feeding me. Well, I didn't know you were still a baby, you know? You, you, you spoon feed babies, but you know, Micah, for instance, he makes his own his own mac and cheese. He doesn't need me. In, in fact, I don't even know how to make mac and cheese now. I'm just kidding. Oh my goodness. <laughs> or, ravioli. Um, or ravioli, especially the cheese variety. <laughs> um, oh, here's my three examples. So then, because we're so starved for spiritual growth, chasing emotional highs becomes our entire focus. I just want to find a little bit of a little bit of relief. I just want to want to get a little bit of a good feeling. Everything sucks so bad. I just I just want to feel a little bit better for just a little for for just a little bit. So then the three uh, three examples I want to give is something that we oftentimes turn to a preacher that gets us excited, right? This guy is really speaks with passion. Oh man, I don't even know what the crap he's saying, but he's really enthusiastic about it. It gets me excited. Woo! The second example, worship we can get into. I don't know what we're singing about. If the songs have a lot of me and I in them, but I don't even care, man. This is, this is, music just makes me feel better. And then the third example, um, a book that makes makes us feel better, right? It doesn't matter if the, what they say in the book is true. It matters if it was written in a really good way, and I think, wow, this is great. This is so great. So I, I, there, I, we obviously need to get a place of admitting we don't know it all, be teachable where people can actually tell us something, um, and make an effort of lifelong growth. You want to be in the kind of mindset where you don't just learn when you're in college. You learn as a lifestyle. It doesn't matter if you're in college or if you're out of college. By the way, I'm, I'm going to grad school. Yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to be going to grad school. I'm not making fun of people in college. But the problem is, is once we get out of college – as older people can relate, once you get out of college, it's like you, the grind of the day hits you and you forget to actually start pursuing knowledge. You know what I mean? It, you you got to raise the kids. You got to cook the food. You got to go to church and do all this stuff. You forget that you're supposed to grow, you know, and you stagnate. Were you about to say something? Or like you, you think you're good, you know, since you right. finished college. You know, I don't need to... I've got my degree. I'm good. <laughs> um but growth should be a lifelong habit. It should be something that you're always, always pursuing. So we're going to look at some specific examples. Um, and uh, part of the problem is that we accept or reject based solely off of whether it sounds and feels good instead of whether it's based on truthfulness. And we'll oftentimes nod our head and say, yeah, 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 I know that. But then somebody will come by and say something, and maybe we feel in our heart this isn't right, but we won't know why it's not right, and we won't do any legwork to figure it out. Or maybe we'll hear something and we'll say, that really gave me hope and peace in this moment. Well, was it true though? Well, I don't know, but it gave me hope and peace. Kind of like we're we are our own standard of what is truth. As so long as it tickles my fancy, it is true. And it's like, well, no, 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 no. It it still does need to be weighted. Like, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing? So uh, the first example I'm going to give is a guy named C. C. Peter Wagner. You probably never heard of him. Um, he was actually the person who uh, coined. Um, the phrase New Apostolic Reformation. 
Um, he was a real big teacher in what's called Dominion Theology. Um, he died a couple years ago, probably seven years ago or something, ten, something like that. Anyways, um, so one of the things that he said that he taught and really, tr really truly believed is, is Dominion Theology. And I mentioned this is now the third time I mentioned this. And the idea is that we have a mandate, literally an obligation, a command from God, right, to have dominion. And he went on and these great lectures trying to explain this about how, you know, our whole purpose of being is to have dominion. And so the gospel is no longer about, you know, God's wrath. It's no longer about our salvation. It's no longer about sin or anything. What it's really about has nothing to do with the cross. It has to do with we need to have dominion. So to that end, we need to establish Christian government. And, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily believe in dominion theology, but the effects of it, they still believe. Here's a good example of this. People... Um, what, it's oftentimes um, people and Christians will, will will talk in great lengths about how about how they need to you know establish moral laws in the U.S., which is a good thing. I'm not saying you shouldn't establish moral laws, but the focus being on raising uh, on Christians being involved in, in government and that kind of stuff, and it's like an undertone of Dominion theology. You know what I mean? And like if we infiltrate it, right? Like we. Our way. Right, exactly, like infiltrating and getting our way. Yes, exact. Yes, we're gonna exactly. We're going to take America back for Christ. Right, right. And so it's not necessarily that they're saying dominion theology, but it just kind of undergirds it. You know what I mean? And um, so the big problem here is that it's no longer about God or the gospel, but our dominion. And to do this, he first off goes to Genesis 1 where it says in the King James Version, go figure, it says about how we are to have dominion over the birds and all that stuff and so he says okay well from day one we were made to have dominion and so what about the context of genesis one irrelevant what about the purpose of having dominion over the animals I irrelevant what is important is that we have dominion it's like well hold on wagner if if you just take it from one translation and then say, because this translation of the actual original says that I'm going to use that to teach my doctrine, that's just that's just lying. So he completely ignores the original meaning of Genesis 1, and then he repurposes it to teach his doctrine that we have, should have dominion. Um, which, by the way, has anything changed since Genesis 1 anyways in our world? Well, maybe a few things, you know? Like how about Genesis 2 and 3? Remember that fiasco? <laughs> anyways... Um, so then uh, I was listening to his lecture, and he brought up Revelations 1.6, and I'm going to read it to you. And this is his proof, okay? This is the NASB right here. This is the 2020 edition of the NASB. And he made us into a kingdom... Priest to his God and Father. Now, if you read it in the King James Version, it the King James Version is not a good translation. I would even say it's a bad translation. I would even say it's almost cultic. And the reason why is because, first off, it, it, it was four, it's 400 years old, and they didn't have access to the manuscripts that we have. And then, as time has, has passed, and we've become more aware of issues, the King James just refuses to budge on it. So, like, for instance, here's a good example. There's a lot of verses that were in the manuscripts that the King James used that were not in the original manuscripts. So what other translations have done is they've taken the mountains and then put them in footnotes and said, oh, these weren't really in the original manuscripts. Here it is just so that you know what it, where it was, and if you're reading from the King James, you'll be able to cross-reference here. But it wasn't in the original. Oh, okay, all right, that makes sense. But the King James, no, they just leave it in there. Even though those verses were added, in some cases, hundreds of years afterwards, oh, well, let's still leave it in. It's like, oh, okay, whatever. And so the King James reads here, and he made us into, uh, and no, and he made us kings and priests. Complete difference in meaning there. Now, the NASB isn't the only one who says this. Let's look at the CSB. Um, and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. Okay, let's look at the ESB. Where is it? Verse 6. And made as a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. All of them are saying the exact same thing, except for the King James, which says, and made as kings and priests. The only other one, guys. 
that's that should give the people who read the King James a little slight moment of pause. But you, but it doesn't. You know what King James readers say? Oh well, we are the we have the only righteous translation. All of them are just uh, filled with um, what's it called? Uh, what? Errors and discrepancies. Discre yeah, but they say something else. It's something about the translators. They're um, um, e one of them even went so far as to call them um, antichrists. Yeah. Who were who were taking out parts of the Bible and it's like. Are you joking, dude? You need to calm the frick down. <laughs> That's what happens when you have no idea about translation theory, and you just make wild assertions because you like a translation. Anyways, so that's the first thing he said that that he says that um, Revelations one six that it says that God made us to be kings and priests. Well, as I just said, it does not say that. It says a kingdom of priests. Okay, so let's see where is it. He made us into a kingdom, priests to God and to His God and Father. And then this part, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. But when he quoted it, when Peter, Peter Wagner quoted it in this lecture, he didn't say that. He said, he made us to be kings and priests to have dominion. That is dishonest. That's not what Revelations 1 6 says. And the entire purpose of Revelation, if you read the book through, has nothing to do with us or for looking for signs of the, uh, of the Antichrist. It is to glorify Jesus and to show how he's in complete control and to give the Christian hope in waiting for Christ, not in the Antichrist. There's a complete difference of perspective that's happening here. So Revelations 1.6 is literally reinterpreted to say something it's not saying. To say instead of a kingdom, king, instead of uh, for God to have, uh, uh, to God belongs the dominion, he created us for dominion. That's a complete dishonest reinterpretation. So then what happens, and he, Peter Wagner is not the only guy who does this. Okay, Take a verse of, of scripture. It doesn't matter where it comes from, what the context is. Ignore all that. You don't need it. This is all that matters, that you can twist it to say that it's talking about something deeper, a mystical meaning beyond the obvious. So Matthew 28, 19 through 20, everybody has heard of the, heard this once. If you've been in church at all, you've heard this. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So obviously he's talking about Jesus sending us out, right? Everybody can agree on that. It's very obvious. But no, that's not what C. C. Peter Wagner says. This is what he says. Well, because he's looking at it in the light of, domin of the dominion theology, it has nothing to do with Jesus or anything like that, it is now a proof for us raising up a, a Christian nation. And his point for that is this. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. His point here is that he wants us to establish Christian uh, government in all the nations. What the frick? Like, what? So... It's completely taken out of context, but because he believes in dominion theology, he's now giving a new meaning to something beyond it. Through, through the lens of it, exactly, and this is where the cultic idea comes in. It's like it's not even it, it's not trying to be honest with what the Bible is trying to say itself. It's trying to give new meaning to back up his his preconception of what needs to happen. So he uses false proof to validate his theory, and that's just that's just retarded. Um, Another specific example that I can give is from the Jehovah's Witness. Um, I, we, we and Yams did a, a long study on Jehovah's Witness. We were on it for a number of weeks. Um, Chuck, I think, actually does uh, Jehovah's Witness videos. Uh, I'm almost done. Yeah. On his. I've, I've got about three more I've got to do, but I've been at it for months. Yeah, and so if you guys want to check that out, Sheep Among Wolves on YouTube. Um, and you know, that's more up to date than the one I the one I did was like three years ago, and it's probably outdated by now. Um, I don't even think we any of those were even recorded, so it's probably longer than that, maybe like six years ago. Anyways, um, one of the things that they teach is that Jesus is not coming, um, he's not returning uh, 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 again physically, like in in the flesh, and a literal se second coming. That that's not happening, and. Uh, I would love to sit and nitpick all the things about Jehovah's Witness because it's such an easy target, but uh, I'm just going to read this one thing that makes it absolutely clear and move on. Um, this is Acts chapter 1, verse 11, and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Did Jesus ascend into heaven literally and physically? Yes. He literally, in the flesh, 
ascended into heaven. And then what do the angels say? He will come in the same way as you have watched him go. Huh. See what I mean? Things were, and what the Jehovah's Witnesses do is they actually have their own translation of the Bible. And the reason why they do this is so that they can reword things in what's called dishonest translation. The, their translation of the Greek is like a child who didn't really speak the language did it. And I say that as a translator. It's, it's embarrassing. Their, their translation is literally an embarrassment to translations. And I don't know of a single serious theologian or Greek translator who stands by that translation. It is a joke. It is seriously a joke. Anyways, and so they go through and they just reword everything to teach their uh, their ideas. And the thing is, they tell everybody the whole time, well, you know, we're, we're the true belief. It's the main Christian church, the evangelical church. They're the corrupted form. Based on what? We've got history on our side, the Bible on our side. Like, well, what's your proof for this grand assertion? And the Jehovah's Witnesses, they came about like in the 18 or 1900s. Or well, Yes, but then what they would say is that, you know, it, the church was corrupted and it was a revival of the true. Um, anyways, so then televangelists, this is something that they say all the time. Oh, it's always God's will to heal. Everything's going to be fine. Nothing but blessings for you. Well, okay, that sounds good. And I'm sure that if you've watched any televangelist, you've heard them say this over and over again. They might not say it in exactly those words, but they say that concept over and over again. Let's look at Amos 4.10, just one example. I sent a plague among you. This is God speaking. I sent a plague among you, as in Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword, along with your court and captured horses. And I made the stench of your camp rise up in your nostrils, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Okay, now let's go back over. It's always God's will to heal. I sent a plague among you. Okay. Everything's going to be fine. I killed your young men with the sword. Okay. Nothing but blessings for you. I made the stench of your camp rise up in your own nostrils. No, no. And so then what they say is something along the lines of this. Well, it's always God's will to heal. But what gets in the way is Satan. It's like, um, I read Amos, and I don't recall God ever blaming it on Satan. He says, you chose to do this. So just kind of a, kind of a big point there. Um, so then one of the biggest lies, a lie, the lie that we tell ourselves, which is two specific lies I'm going to mention. I just know what is true. And if you remember, this is the same statement I brought up when we first started looking at the third white lie a couple weeks, a couple months ago now. Um, I'll just know what is true, or I can decide my own truth. Well, let's look at both of those claims. We'll look at um, Acts 17.11 first off. And so this is the idea, oh, well, I'll just know what's true. Now, these people were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness. Okay, there's the, I will just know what is true, right? But then you re finish reading the verse, examining the scriptures daily to see whether those things were so. They're the Bereans? The Bereans. Oh, I'll just know what is true. Um, I'm sure the Bereans liked what they were hearing too, but they still verified. And keep in mind that Paul was an apostle. And they were still testing it against the Bible. That's kind of a big point. Um, or what about the other lie that we tell ourselves? I can I can just decide my own truth. If it if it feels good to me, then it is true. You can't judge me. Well, let let's look at this. Okay, First John chapter two verse four. Um, one of the most succinct answers you can find. The one who says I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So there's two assert, assert, assertions there. First off, that there is the truth. Second off, that you have to stand, have to follow a standard, his commandments. So I can decide my own truth? No. It said very clearly the truth, and it said very clearly keep his commands. So that's a negative on both of those. There is a definite truth we are held to. So one last thing we're going to look at before we close out for tonight. That's Second Timothy. Um, chapter 3, starting in verse 1. But realize this, that in the last days, um, difficult times will come. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, 
slanderers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips. You know what I think irreconcilable means? And I need to go look up to see if this is what it really means. Where you can't win. You know what I mean? They have made up their mind to be offended. You cannot reconcile the issue. Now, I need to go look up to see in, in the Greek if that's really what that word means. Malicious gossips. So they're not just talking about people. They're doing it hatefully. Without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such people as these, for among them are those who slip into households and captivate weak women, weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jumbra supposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth, men of depraved mind, worthless in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their foolishness will be obvious to all, just as was that also of Janus and Jumbra. So here's a, a, good, a good part about it, that, that the false who come into the church... They won't win. He just said that they will not make further progress. They, they, they won't win in the end. They might win for a time, but so that's kind of kind of encouraging. So one thing that, that you notice from this is Paul's talking about these people who are spiritual connoisseurs, and you see them nowadays too. They sample from place to place, right? There's no commitment. There's no authority structure, but they go from church to church. They sample. They, they, they enjoy for a little bit. They just never stick with it. They never grow. They're never under authority. They stay at a shallow teaching instead of coming to the truth. They, they, love, they love to hear Bible studies. They just never arrive at the truth. Shallow relationships, shallow spirituality. So how do you escape this? Well, there, there's a few ideas that, that I've written down here. Study the Bible in context. Who was it written to? What's different from then till now? Those kinds of things. Study it in context. Um, study it with prayer. Be discerning and wise with what teachers you listen to. Don't just listen to somebody because they claim <laughs> something. Test what they say, especially with these big with these big wigs, because oftentimes you'll notice this. Jesus did not captivate everyone who listened to him. In fact, he never had a large following. There was never the entire nation that was following him. So now, be very wary when you get nowadays when there's somebody who has an extremely large following. I'm not saying that you have to piss people off to be true, and I'm not saying you have to be very like um, that. You have to turn people off. That's not what I'm saying at all. But I'm saying, typically, the world doesn't want to hear about sin. They want to hear about what makes me feel good, and what makes me feel good isn't that God that I need to be reconciled to God. That doesn't make me feel good. That makes me feel powerless. So typically, people are going to lean on things that are going to make them feel a little bit better. Get under authority. You know that you need to get into the church structure. Don't add to the Bible or live contrary to it, or twist it to mean other than the obvious meaning. We looked at examples of all three of those things. And then depend on the church. And I said this last Sunday night in my sermon, and I'll say it again. You are responsible for your Christian growth, but you will not continue to grow if you do not depend on the church. The church is meant to be internet, and a Christian who is not internet with the church is a Christian that stops growing eventually. At first, you'll feel fine. Live for God, love others, keep learning, don't intentionally teach false. So that brings us to next week. We will start looking at that idea that Joyce Meyer brought up about the um, little gods because it is actually based off something that Jesus himself said. So this is very important. We need to actually look at it and consider it. What does it actually mean? So um, any questions about tonight? Comments? One thing I found, like especially listening to televangelists and stuff as a kid growing up, is like a lot of times they they just lead you to more questions without answers. You know? Like like they never actually give you a solid answer for something. They just a lot of times just kinda him haw beat around the bush and hope that you don't want to right. pursue it. And I, I think I know what you're talking about. If you could give a, give a, an example in just a second, but I, um, one thing that is, I think that they do, the reason why they do that is so that they don't have to actually draw the line between you need to commit to Jesus, yeah, because that's where the line of di line of distinction comes. Well, okay, so look at like um, healing. Okay. Okay, so someone, let's say they're born in a wheelchair, for example, <laughs> they they go to someone and they say, well. If it's God's will for someone to always be healed, you know, 
then they just bring up more, well, you know, you just got to have enough faith, or blah, 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 and they never actually give you a solid answer to it. And, you know, with that being said, I, I do have to say this. You know, it might actually be God's desire that people always be healed. He desires that people turn to him and be healed from their sins. But it doesn't always happen. <laughs> but it doesn't always happen for many reasons. Not not only mentioning somebody's sin, but also because sometimes God does not heal that person. I mean, <laughs> take, for instance, uh, uh, old Johnson, who still wears glasses. uh, uh I don't know why I'm blinking on his face. Uh, Bill Bill Johnson, who still wears glasses, but supposedly God always wants to heal. So it's like, okay, there, brother, <laughs> why don't you uh, see about that there? Were you going to say something, Grace? I, I just had a funny comment. You know how like people are always like, oh, you need more faith for God to heal you? Well, in the Bible, when something didn't happen with the disciples it was because the disciples didn't have enough faith. So you can just turn that around and be like, you're not having enough faith when you pray for me. So <laughs> <laughs> you need to have more faith. That would be so funny to say that on a television broadcast. Be like, um, I remember things differently in my Bible. <laughs> I, I, I watched this uh, this terrible clip from uh, this last uh, believers voice of victory year or whatever like there was this guy in a wheelchair and he knocked him backwards oh in his wheelchair poor guy and then he's just like laughing it off and like he's okay he's okay uh god's doing a work and like, oh yeah. was he okay it was dark <laughs> poor I guy I, w I i would have asked him like hey are you okay i'm sorry i threw you backwards <laughs> jeez okay any other questions or comments Okay. No. No question.